Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. When I speak about the past, the present, and the future expositions briefly on space science and technology, I would like to recite a few lines which have inspired me from my school days. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our life sublime, undeparting, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Henry Wordsworth Longfellow, a psalm of, of life. Inscriptions on sand may be washed away by new waves, but the thesis of my presentation is that, in reality, many of these inscriptions may be very old, impressions on somebody and somewhere, and they grow big and opening up new avenues of exploration. We speak today with 52 years of Indian sp space saga. We started in 1963 with the first sounding rocket, Nike Apache, from Tumba. And the officers started blissfully in a historical place, a very old church, St. Mary Magdalene Church, which has roots, which has started actually, not this building, but the church has started in 1544. Today, we have 53 launch vehicle missions, 84 satellite missions, 74 foreign satellites. Just a few days ago, on 22nd, just few, not even a week, on 22nd, we have launched in one shot 20 satellites into orbit within 10 minutes. And uh, this type of global integrated achievement is uh, by any measure uh, not a small achievement. But we have not achieved all this without our early faltering steps. Actually, learning comes from failures. And the most important failure that was a stepping stone to success, I would say, is the failure that we had in July 1988 of uh, the augmented satellite launch vehicle. You can see here, in less than one second, the whole process started at 50 seconds and ended before 51 seconds. In less than a second, you can see the vehicle bending up like the handle of an umbrella and broken up into freak pieces. And we have made extensive simulations and understood the process of control, structure, aero, propulsion, interactions. And uh, we have made a large number of changes. Now we understand the process of these interactions. And this is how, from our faltering steps, from the failures, we have understood and learned what we are achieving today. A launch vehicle travel sequence with system interactions is very complex. And in this uh, brief slide, I put everything in together. And uh, the start at the liftoff to uh, with the jet interactions, to the propulsion, aerostructure control interactions, uh, shock oscillations in uh, uh, transonic flow, supersonic flow, hypersonic flow, unsteady loads, base heating, and uh, separation of the stages and falling of the stages into safe locations, inertial navigation, closed loop guidance, autopilot, nonlinear sensor dynamics, and finally when you're orbiting a large number of satellites to see that they don't collide with each other and also handle the space debris now today is a problem. All these things are done from usually from start, lift off to injection the whole thing will be shown uh, over in 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, this is a very complex thing, and anything can fail here, leading to failures. And this type of situation is very well, beautifully described in the greatest, one of the greatest novels of the world, Anna Karenina, by Leo Tolstoy. And uh, he described these complex interactions through human interactions and human relationships. And the first sentence of this great novel, it goes like this, happy families are all alike and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Today, this perception is now drawn into a principle like, uh, called Anna Karina principle, which describes systems in which a single deficiency in any number of large number of situations, large number of parameters can doom to the system to failure. And therefore, 
the road to success is to remove the possibility of all these failures and then success is assured. And this is called Anna Karenina principle propounded uh, by Jared Diamond in his excellent book Guns, Gems and Steel, The Fates of Human Society. It was uh, written in 1997 and today it is very successfully applied to many fields, for example, sports achievement, uh, hospital management, scientific publications, and this Anna Karina principle is what drives success in our human endeavor. I'm inspired by one of the leaders of the, our space program, Professor Satish Dhawan, and uh, he has said, avian flight shows incredible diversity of flight techniques. We still have to learn uh, from the birds. And of course, as you can see, all aviation is inspired by man observing the bird flight. And Professor Dhawan has written a beautiful scientific book on how, it's, how birds fly. And uh, this fascination continues and we try to apply this thing and to see that in future, uh, today all our spacecraft, all our aviation systems are fairly rigid systems. And tomorrow, the greater maneuverability will be obtained by having them flexible, like birds flex. And uh, today we are very far from that technology, but you can imagine in future aircraft, future aviation systems will use this type of flexibility of bird flight and will, therefore, it is the nature that teaches us. Professor Satish Dhawan is also a great uh, uh, aeronautical engineer, aerodynamics engineer, and he has constructed in the 1950s the first supersonic wind tunnel in the country. These wind tunnels are very important to understand the behavior of the flow, the forces and moments that come on bodies which are flying at various speeds, transonic, supersonic, subsonic, hypersonic speeds. Fine, very good. The very first supersonic wind tunnel in the world uh, was in 1936. It was in Punemunde, north of Germany. And uh, uh, it was where it is here that the V2 rocket uh, was uh, designed. And uh, this was instrumental in several thousands of bombing expeditions in uh, the World War II. Today, if you see what remains of this great first supersonic wind tunnel is but ruins. I had the opportunity to visit these ruins in uh, 2011 and these photographs from the book, Peter Wagner's book, The Punemunde Wind Tunnels, a memoir uh, published in 1996 shows what the state today. And I have uh, represented this by uh, taking a snap of the brick that is there. This is what is the shape of uh, uh, a first supersonic wind tunnel, which was used extensively for the destructive purposes in World War II. Another great inspiration in the books, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. This was one of the books as young engineers we were reading. And it was written by Richard Burke uh, in uh, 1970. And it is about a seagull which wants to learn, which doesn't want to part of the fleet. The purpose of the fleet is to eat, how to get breakfast, how to do, but he wanted to achieve what I can achieve more and more. And that was the theme. And uh, therefore, this is an inspiring story for people who follow their hearts and make their own rules and make their own sacrifices to, uh, to reach higher and higher. And Richard Bach is an aviator, avid aviator, and uh, uh, more than uh, 40 years after the successful uh, writing this book, he had an accident. Uh, uh, he was uh, flying a plane himself, being an aviator, at the age of 76. In 2012, he had this accident, and almost fatal accident, but he survived. I was very thankful. And then four months, he was in the hospital. This near-death experience he has uh, uh, felt at that time made him to, uh, again, he inspired him, and he wrote fourth part of the book. Jonathan Livingston Seagull, which is equally inspiring. Earlier, it has three parts. Another book around the same time I read in my library is uh, written by Theodore von Kahneman, and it's a very great, beautiful book. The book's name is Wind and Beyond. Uh, he's a very great personality in aeronautics, and uh, he's the one of the, uh, considered as one of the true geniuses in this field, one of the true eight geniuses uh, in the whole, uh, in the scientific thing. And uh, he's the one who has uh, uh, discovered the Vertex Street, Carmen Vertex Street, and unsteady loads that come out of it, a really technically very competent person. And then he has felt how the future planes will be. At that time, no planes were there when he has written this. In the future, planes may be expected to take off into the air like a rocket and go like a satellite and come down and re-enter into Earth uh, like a re-entry body. That means 
with this type of technology, he, which he has envisaged, uh, we can go into other side of the globe in matter of one and a half hours or two hours, which now, now takes uh, much, much longer period. And this type of thing is there. Today we have not yet got the technology yet for this type of thing. But still people, many spacefaring countries are working on this. It may be the future airplane of, uh, uh, of, of the world. Many times I'm fascinated right from my school days about uh, the, uh, the confluence of great minds and particularly uh, the meeting of uh, uh, Ravindar Tagore and Einstein. In his book, uh, which I talked about, Wind and Bayan Farkamer said, it is science that can integrate different nations together, he said. And this is one of the great examples. And Tagore and Einstein have met several times. Their conversations have been recorded. Uh, recorded means by handwriting only. That time, that, that's the technology. In 1930, July, when they met, by the time both of them got uh, Nobel Prize, uh, Tagore for literature in 1913, Einstein for physics in 1921, and they were discussing in various aspects. These are all available on the internet. You can see it. And then Dmitry Mirianov, who is a biographer of, of Einstein, was recording all of them. And he had the feeling. Uh, the way Tagore is talking like a scientist and Einstein is talking like a, politi uh, a poet and a religiously inclined man. And therefore he said, Tagore is a poet with the head of a thinker and Einstein is a thinker with the head of a poet. And that is, I would say, is a confluence of great minds together. And in a way, Tagore has a intrinsic and uh, uh, indirect influence on Indian uh, space program. This has happened because uh, when when Vikram Sharabai, who was the father of Indian space program, was his boy, Tagore used to, was a family friend, and used to go and visit their Sharabais uh, now and then. And uh, here you can see, this is Vikram Sharabai. These are all Vikram Sharabai as a child. And therefore, because of this early childhood interaction with them, Vikram Sharabai has got a universality of approach to uh, space research. And that is why our stated, famously stated vision of our Indian space program is, we must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies to the real problems of man and society, to the problems of man and society. The problems of man and society are our theme. And this comes to Vikram Sharabai because of the childhood influence of a universal thinker like Ravindranath Tagore. And I would, therefore, I would say, uh, someone said, where do I come from? We all come from, my, from our childhood. The impressions that are made in childhood are permanent and that govern our thinking in future. One of the things uh, that is a great person uh, is Hermann Obert. Uh, he is considered as one of the founding fathers of astronautics. When he was 11 years old, 10 years old, mother gave him the book, uh, Jules Verne's book, uh, Journey to the Moon, etc. And he read and reread, and he says that he knows it by heart. And then later, uh, later, uh, when he was an young boy in, 20, uh, in his 20s, he wrote a thesis, PhD thesis, doctoral dissertation, uh, which says uh, the, uh, how to go to interplanetary travel, he has written. And then when he submitted to the university, the professor said, what nonsense, this cannot be true, this is too utopian and it is not, it is impractical. They rejected the PhD. It's not given. Then he is he's a rich person coming from a noble family. He has published it himself as a booklet. And then within few years, less than in five, six years, he has demonstrated a, a, a rocket engine working. And to him, with him worked Ferner von, von Braun uh, as an assistant. At that time, Ferner von Braun was 17, 18 years old, young boy. And later he became uh, a great man. He went to America and made, uh, he was one of the persons behind the great success and leadership of uh, American leadership to go to moon, etc. rocket technology. Uh, this is how, uh, despite the fact that many people, current scientific uh, uh, community doesn't understand, the people can go. Herman Oberth has uh, written in his last, uh, uh, one of the books he has written, Man into Space. He said, the aim and his vision is to make available for life every place where life is possible, to make inhabitable all worlds as at uninhabitable, and all life is purposeful. That's the type of vision he has got. And I had the uh, privilege of uh, meeting him in person when he was 91 years old in Innsbruck in 1986. And I also had this card. And here, if you can see it, he is his signature. The 91-year-old Herman Obert signed for me. And I keep it as a, uh, my one of the great personal possessions. Another extraordinary genius, 
uh, which influenced Jules Verne. I told you, Robert also, mother gave the book when he was 10 or 11 years old and he was inspired to achieve all this thing. And this is Robert, uh, Jules Verne. I, I considered him an extraordinary genius. We all read these books when we were children. And then uh, he, long, long ago, he has uh, uh, anticipated uh, scientific discovery of the 20th century. Because in his journey to the moon, he described how can you use optimally uh, the systems, what today call Lagrange points. Uh, and uh, today we are trying to do such missions. And uh, surprisingly, I think it is a stroke of genius uh, that he has conceived. Many people doubt whether he knows about Lagrange points or not, how can he know at that time. But still, he has visualized this thing. That is the greatness. That is the genius of great people. And H.G. Wells, another, some of you certainly have written the time mission, uh, read the time mission, uh, the book time mission of H.G. Uh, Wells. It's a different concept. Just as we go from one point to another, uh, from here to orbit, from here to Mars, can you also go in time, from here to future, from here to past? Uh, he has written uh, such thing uh, in the time machine, conceived like this thing. We may think that is impossible. It is just science fiction. No, it is not so. Uh, today, the uh, great sci uh, latest scientific theories uh, based on special theory of relativity suggest that s under suitable geometries of space and time, you can, it is possible to time travel. It is not against physical principles. Therefore, in future, such things may be possible. Many times, as I told you already, things that are told at one time may not be understood, but they will be interpreted, understood, developed as realities in future. This may happen here also. This brings to me uh, to this beautiful little book that is written by St. Exupery. Uh, you all know about it, I hope so. And if you are not, this is a really inter inspiring book. This is a book written, uh, Little Prince, Lapiti Prince, uh, 1943 by uh, Antoine St. Exupery for children. But it is really a book for adults. It is a highly philosophical book in which uh, the little prince who lo lives on the uh, asteroid B612 uh, had some problem with his rose, his wife, and. Uh, um, actually, the rose is, represents his uh, wife, Anthony's, uh, sent, except for his wife, uh, symbolically, and he comes to Earth and gets uh, uh, knowledge and he goes back, understands this thing. It's almost like our stories of Panchatantra. And then, this is the third most translated book in the world. And recent translation is to Sanskrit. And this has been done by Professor Gopapandu Mishra, uh, who is the pro head of the department of uh, Sanskrit department in Benares Hindu University. He was on a sabbatical at, uh, in Paris in 2012. And at that time, he has written and translated this thing. He wrote it as a play also. Here you can see Kaniya and Rajkumarha, the little prince, Lapati prince, the latest trans uh, thing in this. And this was in uh, 2012 enacted in uh, Paris. Uh, uh, a picture which I got my, from my friend in which uh, some of the things are there. And then uh, one of the things, uh, one of the important secrets uh, that the little prince learns is from the fox. And here is my secret, my very simple secret. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. And not what is essential is not visible to the eye. It is visible to the heart. A new type of uh, uh, horizon will come. Uh, from the orbital satellites that we are having, from the remote sensing satellites we are having, and from the uh, so much of uh, human res uh, things that we are getting from the, the new technology of space, you may go to the new habitats. It may be an essential, and uh, many thinkers uh, uh, believe that it is going to happen. It is the writing on the wall. And uh, for example, here I depict some of the things. It is a, one of the things called Stanford Taurus, uh, which is a space colony uh, in the um, uh, above in space. It will be rotating to give you artificial gravity. And this is a team going into Mars and then working on the terraforming. And therefore, you can make it uh, more ecologically uh, good for this thing. And therefore, what I say is that in your lifetime, all these things are going to happen. And this is the writing on the wall. It is indeed will happen. And when we go and achieve these things, let us remember that we all do it for the benefit of the humanity and everybody in humanity and benefit of the world. And uh, when we do this thing, let us remember not only human beings, uh, not only all living beings, living and non-living systems should be protected when we do it. Let us remember that responsibility that we all have. And uh, I would like to close uh, my brief talk and an exposition into this type of future uh, by saying uh, that uh, we want to go into that heaven of freedom 
where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, as sung in Gitanjali by the great Vishwakavi Ravina Tagore. Thank you, gentlemen.